Okay, well, welcome to the 2014 version of the Surface Water Treatment Workshop. Uh, this is a, a pre-workshop presentation that seems to be a little popular uh, from year to year, and so they brought it back this year. My name is Delvin DeBoer. Um, I'm with AE2S, and uh, it's my privilege to be able to spend a couple hours with you this morning talking about surface water. The, uh, the primer, or I don't, sometimes they'll call it a primer, to get you primed up for the rest of the workshop, but I call it a primer. It's intended to be uh, a place where folks can come and, and sort of get refreshed on what it is we're about in surface water treatment. And uh, so we'll cover several topics. And in fact, let's just go ahead and take a look at this outline. We wanna talk about the characteristics of surface water and what the objectives of treatment are for surface water. We'll talk about regulations affecting surface water treatment. Um, the dr uh, regulations really drive what we do. And so in addition to making the water so that it's pleasant to drink, we wanna make sure that it's safe to drink. So we wanna talk about the regulations. And then we'll get into a little bit of technical detail. We'll talk about treatment plant schematics that are typically used for surface water treatment facilities in this area. And then we'll uh, talk about some of the process details, some fundamentals. You know, one of the things that uh, I think is very important for us all to do is have a, a feeling that we're not dealing with a black box. We are dealing with a system that uh, we know about, that we are comfortable with, and so uh, that's what we'll try and introduce you to some of the fundamentals of surface water treatment today. Okay, uh, I know most of you have had some experience observing surface water. And uh, I've been privileged to work with several different surface waters in Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. And here's some examples of three different waters uh, samples from South Dakota. Uh, the one to the left is uh, uh, from the Missouri River Reservoir, the Oahe Reservoir near Pier. The one in the middle is, uh, I believe, uh, the Elm River near Aberdeen, South Dakota. And the one to the right is the Big Sioux River uh, near Sioux Falls. And, you know, you can sort of look at that and say, hmm, if you were to treat these waters, which one do you think would be the best one to treat or the easiest one to treat? And you might think, well, I'll take that one to the left. Actually, it's probably one of the more difficult ones to treat because it has a turbidity of about four and low turbidity waters uh, with at least chemical processes and physical processes are ones that are a little more difficult to handle than ones that have something for the process to work with, we say. And so um, it also has organic matter in it that can combine with chlorine to form trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids, which is uh, interesting. And so if we put this in a system with free chlorine residual, it'll go out in the system and grow trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids and eventually cause a violation of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, the two in the middle uh, have a little bit more visible turbidity and color and can be treated chemically as well as with membrane systems. Have some friends in the audience from, from out west uh, who uh, were working with this last spring. Uh, this is uh, the Missouri River uh, just uh, at the Williston intake. And last spring, uh, the folks out there experienced a a sizable turbidity event. And so the jar to the left here has somewhere around four to 5,000 turbidity units or NTU of turbidity. The one in the middle has about maybe two to 300 and the one to the right was the treated water from that treatment facility. And so in some cases, some of the rivers around here get sort of muddy and we have to deal with that and make it so that the water is safe to drink. So when we start to characterize source waters. Uh, we start to look at the constituents that are in that water. Some of those constituents might be suspended solids like clay and algae, uh, bacteria, other types of organisms that need to be removed, otherwise they would make us sick. There might be organic matter as distinguished from organisms. That organic matter in many cases is naturally occurring organic matter that results from degradation of organic substances out in the watershed. Sometimes we'll call those disinfection byproduct precursors because those substances can react with chlorine to form disinfection byproducts. But there might be other things such as ag chemicals, 
pharmaceuticals, personal care products that make their way into the river as a result of wastewater discharges. We have substances that cause tastes, odor, and color. And so those substances uh, uh, might be ones that are in the water as the result of dying algae. Uh, some of it called uh, uh, MIB or methyl isoborneol or a geosmin. They cause a musty odor. Uh, you'll know it when you smell it. Um, and so they could be in the water. Inorganic substances are commonly there and the concentration of inorganic substances depends upon where that water is coming from. As you'll see when we look at water quality variations in surface water, the inorganic concentrations will change from season to season. We have organisms. These are the ones that, of course, we want to remove from the water to make sure that people don't get ill. And then finally, we'll have changes in temperature. And that temperature change has a big influence on how that water behaves in the treatment facility and how it behaves out in the distribution system. Of course, we're engaging the hydrologic cycle. In fact, we've done that recently. The last couple of days, we've been engaged. You know, rainfall and runoff is a part of where we're getting our water supply from. And of course, we have surface supplies and other ways uh, uh, that water will get into the atmosphere through evaporation and transpiration. We get the right conditions in the atmosphere to cause precipitation. It hits the surface of the earth. It can run off into freshwater storage through streams, spring, or through streams and rivers, and also can recharge groundwater. So it gets into the ground, infiltrates, finds a formation that can transmit that water. It might be you know, gravel or sandy formation and move through the groundwater to points of discharge, which might be a spring. It might move into uh, lakes and rivers through interconnections between the aquifer and that lake or river. It could move into the ocean through that same kind of interconnection. So we have surface runoff and ground runoff. Surface runoff moves over the soil, groundwater runoff moves through the soil. Eventually, those are supplying water to our surface water sources. So what are the characteristics of the surface runoff and the ground or subsurface runoff? Well, that surface runoff can be cold. It could be melt water from um, snow and, and such. And so we might have uh, extremely cold water or it could be your normal summer rainfall event. But what it does is it, it brings sediment to the river. It also can stir up the bed load or the bed sediment in the river and cause turbidity. It can bring organic matter along with it. Uh, soil particles contain organic matter or it can simply wash organic matter into the river. We can control that runoff somewhat if we do some riparian work along the river to try and uh, clean up that water before it enters the river. But in many cases, uh, it's uncontrolled. We're at the mercy of nature. And those events come and we just are prepared for them. Subsurface runoff depends upon uh, several things. Um, if the river is high, typically the aquifers are not contributing a lot of water to the river just because of the hydraulic gradient effect. But when the river is low, then those aquifers typically can discharge into the river because there's a higher pressure, you might call it in the aquifer, that can drive the water into the river. And so the quantity of subsurface runoff that is contributed to the river depends upon the river stage. Typically, the lower the river, the greater will be the quantity of groundwater recharge into a river. That groundwater recharge will have a higher mineral content than surface water runoff. And typically we can't control it. It's just as a function of river stage. We want to talk a little bit about uh, those uh, effects of the, uh, the watershed on water quality. Before we get to that, I want to just mention that temperature is, is really an important factor that affects our treatment and the quality of water in, in, in distribution systems. In colder temperatures, that water can gain a higher saturation value for dissolved oxygen. Typically, it'll have decreased algal activity because the algae just don't grow as fast. During transitions between summer and winter and winter and summer, we can have conditions that cause a turnover in our reservoirs. And so that turnover causes an issue relative to water quality. It can actually stir up the water in the river. Um, during warmer temperatures, we can have increased algal activity, increased uh, chances for taste and odors. 
uh, and lower saturation dissolved oxygen. And so those are things that influence the water quality as we receive it in a surface water plant. But it also will impact the behavior and treatment processes and distribution systems. We all know this idea that you know, the higher the temperature, the faster reaction rates are. And so that's true for most reactions that we have in our system. But also it influences the physical character of water. Colder temperature water is more dense, has higher viscosity. And so it takes more energy to move that colder water. And if we're trying to move it in a physical process, then we'll have to put more energy in it to get it to move. And so we have those kinds of factors that occur uh, through treatment and out into the distribution system. Just want to show you some examples of water quality from our states that are here, North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota. So this happens to be near Sioux Falls. In fact, it's water quality that was measured at the Sioux Falls intake uh, during that transition time between January and April. And you can see that there's a significant runoff effect impacting water quality. We have three different water quality parameters, turbidity, hardness, and alkalinity. The turbidity is the, the blue diamonds. And you can see that that runoff event causes a huge increase in turbidity. Uh, turbidity is up to 180, which in some of our experiences, well, that's, that's just crazy low. In some of our experiences, that's crazy high, just depending upon what our surface water is. Also important is to see the impact on the dissolved constituents of the water. Here we have hardness decreasing down to a very low value, you know, starting out here in, in January in the 16, uh, 600s and then decreasing down to in that 100 to 200 range. That's going to have a significant impact on the softening process in the treatment facility. There will be lots of adjustments that need to be made to lime feeds, to recarbonation to be able to accommodate that. In addition to that, the alkalinity is dropping down into the 100 range. And so you end up with uh, that impact on that softening process as well. Here's the Red River near Grand Forks. Uh, this happens to be uh, through the years uh, 2013. You can see that there's hardness in the water. This green is the total hardness. The purple color is the total alkalinity. The blue is the calcium hardness and the red dots are magnesium hardness. So this is a slide simply showing the influence of time of year on the dissolved inorganic substances that are in the water. And again, in this spring runoff season, we get a dip in concentration down to a fairly low value. And again, the operators actually who have experience in understanding this dip are making adjustments in the treatment facility to be able to accommodate that, uh, adjusting lime feeds and so forth. Uh, throughout the rest of the summer, things are pretty steady for 2013. But just during that April, May runoff event is when there's issues. Uh, my suspicion is that rainfall events that cause changes in the flow in the, in the river are responsible for these periodic dips that happen here. This is the Missouri River near, near Williston, 2013 data as well. This is from uh, the 17th of May to the 24th. So this is one week of data. Uh, illustrating turbidity concentrations that are uh, nice and easy here down uh, in the 400, 500 range. Pretty simple in that Williston plant to be able to treat that. But when we start to see these spikes up into the thousands uh, to close to 1800 here, um, those get a little more touchy. And you have to make some adjustments in the active flow process to be able to accommodate that. And so uh, that treatment facility is uh, designed to be able to handle reasonable amounts of turbidity. Uh, when they get unreasonable is when you start to go, mm. like in the four or 5,000, you start to go, uh, we have to make some serious adjustments here. So the illustration here is that within one day's time, the turbidity goes from 400 to 1,200 or 1,800 and then back down. So that surface water facility receiving water from the Missouri River, which is downstream of the confluence between the Missouri and the Yellowstone, sees very flashy uh, turbidity events. Uh, some are longer term, but this happens to be a time of year where the river flow is high, those turbidity events are carried past the intake, and adjustments need to be made. And one final one, wouldn't we have to get St. Cloud or Minnesota in the mix? Uh, they have an intake that's you know, in a stretch of the river 
that has a dam upstream and downstream, if I remember correctly. And, and so they have sort of a reservoir there. Turbidity concentrations are pretty low. Uh, this is several years of data, about four and a half years of data. The blue dots here are turbidity, and you can see that there are certain times of the year, spring runoff, where turbidity events occur. But that's overshadowed by the color that's in the water. The green dots are color measurements, and the color units are over here. You can see colors very, well, it corresponds with high levels of turbidity and is associated with runoff events and so forth. But this water is more difficult to treat because of its color flashiness and the organic concentrations as well. We have TOC in the red here. TOC is ranging from 5 to maybe 20 in some of the peaks here. So rather in this facility of being concerned about turbidity events like Williston is, these folks are concerned more about color events and taste and odors associated with that. You get the picture here that surface water facilities have uh, variations in raw water quality that they need to deal with. And these variations depend upon the nature of the watershed, the nature of the water source. I think I have one more slide here showing some data from TOC concentrations in South Dakota. We have the Elm River up by Aberdeen, Lake Compesca, which was a, a water source for the city of Watertown. Since then, they've gone away from that and just gone to groundwater. And the Missouri River near Yankton, South Dakota. So the Missouri River, which is downstream of the reservoir system, generally doesn't see a lot of change in the organic concentration. But Lake Compasca sees runoff events that are from the nearby watershed, small watershed. So you see ranging here between six and eight uh, uh, TOC uh, milligrams per liter of carbon. And the Elm River, much more flashy, downstream of a little lake, but really subject to spring runoff. And so, as we think about what we've talked about so far, we've talked about the impacts of the season of year on the water quality that we're receiving. And in surface water facilities, it really depends upon where you're at. It depends upon that nature of the watershed, uh, whether or not you're in a reservoir system or in a river system. And uh, these uh, concentrations need to be accommodated in the treatment process. And so as you operate these facilities or design the facilities, we're very conscious of the changes in raw water quality in these uh, surface water systems. Now we're extending into the distribution system and saying what are the impacts of temperature changes on distribution system water quality. Here we have for Aberdeen, South Dakota, a plot of uh, chlorine residual in the distribution system. The orange is the minimum values that were experienced out there. The blue values or the blue dots are the average concentrations, and then the green triangles are temperature. So we have a seasonal variation in temperature during the cold times of the year, of course it's low. Summertime, surface water temperature is up in that 20 to 25 degrees C. If we look at what happens in the distribution system as a result, we see the chlorine minimum concentrations at a low when the temperature is high. We would expect that to happen because of the fact that chlorine is going to be reacting with substances in the water. That reaction rate is faster during the summertime. And since the organic concentrations typically are higher in the summer as well, then there's more for that chlorine to react with. And so we end up with a decay of chlorine in the distribution system that relates to temperature. During the winter time, the total organic carbon in the raw water goes down, the reaction rate goes down as well, so we're able to sustain that chlorine residual in the distribution system easier in the winter than during the summer. So not only are we concerned about what happens in the treatment facility, we're also concerned about what happens out in the distribution system. One more slide showing that impact of temperature on reactions in the distribution system. Uh, Aberdeen uses a phosphorus compound for uh, sequestering uh, uh, metallic ions in the distribution system like calcium and they also use it for corrosion control. It's a blended ortho and polyphosphate. Well the polyphosphate will revert to orthophosphate as, as time goes on, as it uh, sits in the water. And that reversion rate is of keen interest to Aberdeen because they're trying to use that orthophosphate as a, as a protection against corrosion. And so it, it represents an inhibitor, if you want to call it that. 
And that orthophosphate then is, is, is wanting to, we want to have that orthophosphate have a consistent concentration throughout the year to provide that consistent protection against copper corrosion in their particular case. And so here we are looking at impacts of temperature on water quality in the distribution system and looking at the impacts on reversion. The uh, orange dot here represents the percent reversion of poly to orthophosphate. And you can see that that reversion changes with temperature. During the summertime when the temperature is high, there's higher reversion. During the wintertime when the temperature is low, there's less. This is really not a good situation because we want to have a consistent orthophosphate concentration in the distribution system. So this makes the operators think about what dosage should they have of this orthophosphate throughout the year or the blended orthophosphate to get this consistent ortho residual. Okay, so got some information from around the states that we live in relative to changes in water quality. In the treatment facility, it's gonna cause us to make changes in chemicals that we feed. We might bring in certain chemicals through uh, the certain time of the year that we won't have during other times of the year. For example, we might use that powdered activated carbon for taste and odor control during times when we have taste and odors and back off on its concentration when we don't. So that varying quality uh, requires changes in chemical dosages and feeds as well. Varying temperatures impact reactions that occur in the plant and also the behavior in the distribution system. Uh, another <laughs> impact of temperature is on the ability to disinfect. Uh, reaction rates are faster for killing organisms when the water is warmer than when it's colder. So we can make some adjustments to chemical feeds to accommodate that as well. Okay, so with that background in changes or variations in water quality, let's also then look at uh, the distribution or the, the, the rules that we have to uh, comply with in the treatment facility and in the distribution system. Got a list of rules. And um, you know, this is simply a list to look at. We'll dig into some of these rules in a little detail here in a second. Um, it's a part of our duty. It's a part of our obligation as professionals in this business to know these rules. Um, and from my perspective, it's head knowledge. It's not I know on the place on the internet where I can go find them uh, because we are expected to use this as a part of our knowledge that is applied uh, to be able to do treatment like we should or to be able to handle water and distribution systems like we should. So my challenge to me and my challenge to you all is for us to make this knowledge our, in, our, in our head rather than just a place where I can go find it if I need it because it really derives what we do you know, in the treatment system. We have primary standards that uh, apply to uh, drinking water. And essentially their applicability is because uh, research has been done to find out that if we drink water with high concentrations of this substance, it makes us sick. So it's a health-related uh, drinking water regulation. They're regulated either as a maximum contaminant level or as a treatment technique. And public water systems are required to comply with these rules. So uh, the MCL is set at an acceptable level of risk after much study. And I really like the direction that uh, the EPA has gone in balancing risk with the cost of treatment and comparing that risk with other kinds of risks that we uh, endure in our lives. And so rather than just saying, hey, we can't have any of this in the water, there is a study of how much can we have of this in the water and still be healthy or still have a regular uh, 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 life, uh, rather than saying, no, we can't have any of this. And that, you know, um, to me, over my lifetime in, in, as a professional in this business has been a really important move, understanding the risk of exposure to these substances before we regulate them. So for example, in uh, surface water, these disinfection byproducts, trihalomethanes and haloacetic acids, have a cancer risk associated with them. And the MCL is 0.08 milligrams per liter for THMs and 0.06 for HAAs. Those are concentrations of samples that are collected out in the distribution system 
where the customers are actually using the water. We have a, another type of standard. It's a treatment technique standard for Giardia. Uh, the interim and, and long-term and, uh, long one enhanced surface water treatment rule said you need to be able to remove, sorry, this is a surface water treatment rule. Surface water treatment rule said you need to be able to have the capability to remove or inactivate 99.9% .9 of the Giardia that are in the water. That's three log or three orders of magnitude. So we typically say this is three log removal capability that we need to establish in our surface water system. So um, these are examples of these rules. There's a long list of these that include inorganic substances, organic substances, organisms, uh, just substances that have been found to cause us to be sick in surface water and groundwater in some cases. We also have secondary standards that we want to meet. These secondary standards impact the aesthetic quality of water. Public water systems are not required to meet the standard. Uh, they can choose whether or not they want to meet the standard, such as for taste and odor issues, color issues, corrosivity, total dissolved solids, iron and manganese. There are suggested levels or concentrations of these in the secondary uh, list of standards that uh, uh, EPA suggests that you meet and the public water supply governing body says we're going to or we're not going to. Okay, so what we want to do is just look at some of the rules and understand the influence of surface water quality or surface water treatment on compliance with these rules. So the first one we want to look at is the total coliform rule. And we've been in the business for a while understanding that the coliform organism is an indicator of uh, potential or uh, historic contamination perhaps from a human um, uh, source. Uh, it inhibits our, inhabits, it inhabits our bodies. Uh, commonly, we have thousands of these. It's present in our fecal matter. And so if we find these in drinking water, we say there's a potential for a historic contamination event to have happened. Could be that there's human waste here. And if there's potential for human waste, there's potential for other pathogenic organisms that might cause us to be sick. And so, it is a great way, an inexpensive way, for us to determine the safety, microbiological safety of water that we drink. We've gone to a presence-absence test. This shows a cold alert test. The middle one here uh, represents a, a negative result. The yellow one is a positive result. And if we put it under a UV lamp and it uh, fluoresces like this, then it indicates the potential for E. coli to be there. And so there's a quick test, a presence-absence test that is run on samples that we collect out in the distribution system according to a sampling plan. And we really don't want to see positives. We are allowed a positive, but as a result of the rule, we need to go back and do rechecks. And we're not gonna get into the details of that to determine whether or not that positive is real or not. If we find that it is real, then we get to the point of having to do public notice. Uh, to uh, tell the customers, hey, our water's unsafe to drink, as indicated by our back tea tests. And until we tell you otherwise, boil your water. So it can get to that. There's revisions to this rule coming out April 1, uh, 2016. And I'm sure our local regulatory agencies will be doing educational events to get us all in line with that. But the point is, with surface water supplies, this is an extremely important <coughs> judge of the safety of water in our distribution system. We're more concerned about this with surface water systems than with groundwater systems, even though we are equally concerned from a standpoint of public safety for groundwater systems. The potential for having pathogenic organisms in surface water supplies is much greater, just because of the influence of runoff and how quickly that can contaminate our system. You know, and some of us are old enough to live through Milwaukee and live through other um, uh, significant events that have caused us to pay attention to surface water treatment. And as a result of that, we understand how acute these reactions are and how quickly populations can be affected. And this is the way that uh, the industry has chosen to ensure the safety of drinking water quality. Another rule that um, is important, <laughs> it came out in the 90s, and actually right about the time when I was a younger person getting involved with how do we adjust water quality to make sure lead and copper don't leach from consumers plumbing. It's the lead and copper rule. And the idea here is that aggressive waters or corrosive waters can interact with uh, the plumbing devices in our homes and cause them to corrode. Uh, copper pipe or lead and copper in brass 
uh, those things are, uh, can be attacked by an aggressive water. And as that water sits in the pipe overnight, it uh, can leach this or dissolve or corrode this lead and copper into the water. And if we take that first draw sample in the morning, what are we drinking? Uh, we're drinking perhaps high concentrations of lead and copper. And so the intent of this rule was trying to, uh, to try and minimize that. And as a result, uh, sample plans had to be developed, uh, targeting the, the, the more um, susceptible houses in the distribution system, perhaps those that had lead service lines or copper plumbing that had been soldered with tin lead solder. And those sample plans were followed then in collecting first draw samples at homeowners uh, residences. And those samples are uh, compared against what we call a 90% action level or 90th percentile action level. And if that uh, concentration of that sample at that action level exceeds these values, a treatment technique is exerted. You're not in violation if you exceed those values, you're in violation if you don't do anything about it. And so you are encouraged then by the rule to do lead and copper corrosion control or treatment. And that typically involved either raising the pH of the water or adding an inhibitor to the water to inhibitate, inhibit lead and copper corrosion. Let's move on to the drinking water, the, the disinfection byproduct rules for drinking water. Uh, the uh, stage one DBPR had an MRDL and an MCL associated with it. Love these acronyms. Um, the maximum residual disinfectant level is for disinfectants that we use in the treatment facility. And samples are collected for compliance with this rule at the same sample sites where we collect bag teas. Concentrations of chlorine, if you're using free chlorine, would be free chlorine. If you're using chloramines, would be total chlorine. Those are measured at the same time those samples are collected and averaged. And the monthly average is uh, incorporated into uh, quarterly, uh, a calculation of a running annual av average, act actually. And the average of those concentrations cannot exceed these values. Sometimes there's this misperception that we can't leave the plant with a concentration greater than four. And the answer is you can leave the plant with a concentration greater than four. You just can't have the averages of those samples that are collected in the distribution system. The running annual average of those averages be greater than four. Chlorine dioxide is sometimes used as a disinfectant, so we see an MRDL for that as well. And then like I've mentioned before, we have MCLs for disinfection byproducts. The top two are, are disinfection byproducts where free chlorine residuals in water react with organic matter to form THMs and HAAs. The bottom two typically are disinfection byproducts resulting from the use of other disinfectants. Ozone has the, has the capability of reacting with bromide to form bromate. And so if your raw water has high concentrations of bromate, you might exceed this value. There are modifications that can be made to the ozonation process or adjustments that can be made to the environment under which ozonation occurs to inhibit formation of bromate, such as the use of ammonia or depressing the pH. So we can do some control on this, but it's one of the concerns that we have if we use ozone. Chloride is a decomposition product of chlorine dioxide. It will decompose to chloride. And um, so we have an, an MCL for chloride as well. And that typically limits the concentration of chlorine dioxide that we can use. Typically we'll see somewhere between 70 to 80% of the chlorine dioxide dose appear as chloride in the system. So you can see that chloride, chlorine dioxide dose might be limited to maybe 1.2 to 1.3 milligrams per liter, unless you destroy the chloride residual, which you can do using ferric compounds and so forth. Okay, another part of the DBP rule is uh, the precursor removal requirement. The organic matter that's in water can react with the chlorine to form disinfection byproducts. And so in the wisdom of this rule, the authors said, hey, if you have the capability to remove that organic matter, you should. And systems such as conventional coagulation systems and softening systems can be optimized to, to remove organic matter. And that's what this table is about. The table says if your source water quality or alkalinity is in these ranges and your TOC is in these ranges, you figure out where you are in terms of range and find out what your percent removal requirement is, 
uh, in your conventional coagulation system or your softening system. Uh, softening systems typically have to deal with the right-hand column here. So, for example, if we're in the Missouri River, our alkalinity is typically greater than 120 milligrams per liter of calcium carbonate. Our TOC may range between 2 and 4, or between 4 and 8, depending upon what year we're in. So let's say we're less than 4, we would be at 15% TOC removal for that particular month. The TOC removal is judged based upon paired samples of raw and treated water. Uh, knowing those TOC concentrations, we can calculate percent removal and see whether or, not, whether, whether or not we're complying with this rule. There are alternative compliance criteria with this rule that have been um, put out there. There's six of them basically saying there are special conditions under which you don't have to meet these percent removals. Uh, the one that's used a lot uh, in Western North Dakota, South Dakota is the SUVA uh, one that says if your SUVA is less than or equal to two of the treated water, then you can use that as your compliance criteria rather than percent removal. Okay, so this makes sense. It says, hey, if you have the capability to remove organic matter, you should optimize the system to do that. It's another way to reduce the risk or reduce the potential for creation of THMs and HAAs in the system. Well, as time goes on, uh, uh, the EPA relooks at these rules and says, you know what, we're going to make a modification. And in the case of the disinfection byproduct rule, a modification was made that says to the effect of, you know, we want to refine where you collect samples out in the distribution system. We want to ensure that we are getting uh, samples reflecting the highest concentration of THMs and HAs in the distribution system. So stage two of the DBP rules said, do an evaluation of your system to refine your sampling points, then adjust your sampling points and calculate your compliance based upon a locational running annual average, meaning at those locations where you are collecting those samples, do a running annual average of the concentrations and the highest one is the one that you're going to be using for compliance or judging against the compliance with 0 0.08 milligrams per liter of uh, THMs and 0 0.06 milligrams per liter of HAAs. The other thing this rule did is said to consecutive systems who actually were not included under the stage one rule, said to them, well, you guys need to comply as well. So if you're a wholesaler, you have a, a municipal system and you sell water to another smaller system, or perhaps even to a larger system. That other system now has to collect samples and do compliance as well. Uh, amazingly, they didn't have to in the first round of the disinfection byproducts rule, so now they're in. Then we have this list of surface water treatment rules, which are rules intended to try and focus on specific contaminants or specific organisms. The stage one, oh, sorry, the, the surface water treatment rule, the initial one, came out in response to issues relative to GRD and viruses. And so the rule says you need to have in your treatment facility the capability for removing 99.9% of GRD coming into the plant or 99.99% of viruses coming to the plant. Since these are particles, they can be removed in filtration and they can also be killed with disinfection. So an allowance or credit was made for a well-operated facility using different types of filtration. And for a conventional treatment facility, if you were achieving 0.5 NTU in the combined filter effluent 95% of the time, you were given two and a half log credit for that three log credit of Giardia removal and two log credit for that four log credit of virus removal. And so under that rule, the filter effluent NTU, combined filter effluent, needed to be less than a half. Well, after Milwaukee, uh, the Congress got on the bandwagon of saying, hey, you know, here's a treatment facility that was meeting the requirements of the surface water treatment rule, and yet we had so many people get sick and so many people die. So why is that, and what can we do to adjust our treatment requirements to make sure that doesn't happen as frequently as it does? So in this particular case, they came out with an interim enhanced surface water treatment rule applying to large systems, and the longer term one enhanced surface water treatment rule 
applying to systems less than 10,000, I believe it was, saying you need to have the capability to achieve 99% removal of crypto. In the uh, water that comes to the treatment plant, the crypto is in a cyst form, a, a particle, and filtration can be optimized to remove particles. Studies were done to show that 99% uh, removal of crypto can be achieved or indicated in your facility if your treatment uh, combined effluent turbidity is less than 0.3 NTU. And so now rather than meeting 0.5 NTU, surface water treatment facilities had to meet 0.3 NTU. Easily done. Uh, in a well-operated surface water treatment facility, we can achieve below 0.01 NTU regularly. And so this is not uh, something that uh, requires a lot of uh, extra energy or specialized treatment facilities. It's just a matter of optimizing existing facilities to be able to meet that requirement. The next version of the interim enhanced surface, or the en enhanced surface water treatment rule is for LT2. When the in interim enhanced surface water treatment rule and LT1 were in place, we didn't have, and actually it was the, the research to understand what would actually cause a crypto to not live. That was not done. We didn't have good evalu evaluation tools to determine whether or not the crypto are dead or they're inactivated. And so research was done to determine what's the best way to measure crypto to find out if they were actually dead. And um, over a period of time, they figured out uh, this is the way we can evaluate inactivation of crypto. Once we can do that evaluation, now we can understand what treatment does to them. And so while that work was done, we were working uh, under the requirements of the interim enhanced and long-term one. Long-term two came through and now we have tools that we can use to kill crypto that we can understand, such as using ozone or chlorine dioxide or UV, or perhaps we can optimize some of the other processes in our facility that now become a part of our toolbox for crypto inactivation or crypto removal in addition to filtration. So once that was known and developed into a regulation, now we have the capability to go out and measure crypto in our source water and judge the extent of additional disinfection or removal that we need to have in order to make sure that our water is safe to drink. So as a part of LT2 systems, surface water systems need to go out and do source water analysis to find out what level of crypto was in their raw water. They call that a bin classification. And once that bin classification was known, then the required effort for additional disinfection was known and additional tools can be brought in to do that. This was so cool. You know, I lived, I lived through this. Uh, you know, some of you other ones in here have gray hair like me and have been through the whole idea of uh, following that um, part of our life when they were trying to figure out how do you measure crypto. Going to conferences and hear people talk about their research efforts saying, uh, we got this tool that we can use and can we standardize this tool? And over a period of years coming to that level of standardization on the analytical technique. The same thing is true with many of the things that require uh, Safe Drinking Water Act regulation. Uh, back in the 70s uh, when disinfection byproducts uh, control was started is when we started dealing with chromatography and being able to analyze for trihalomethanes down to a Nat's eyeball. And so as that technology was developed, then the research was done to determine the cause and effect of that um, uh, contaminant on health, and then that progressed to uh, drinking water regulation. Uh, folks, this is just so cool to uh, help us understand how our environment can affect us and see this technology enable us to do that. And um, you might think as a water treatment professional, well, they're doing it to us again with this other regulation. An alternate way to think about this is, all right, we are understanding the cause and effect of contaminants our water, and we get to treat the water to make it more healthy. It's an opportunity for us. And it's just a, uh, that's why it's such a pleasure to work in this field, is, is that it's, it's, it's one of those things where we, we can understand this cause and effect health, and then, uh, basically make it so that as a society we're, we're healthier as a result of better water. A filter backwash rule was actually a result of a more a, a better understanding of hey if we if we use this filter to remove crypto and we backwash the filter and bring that backwash water into the plant without adequate treatment 
Aren't we creating a slug of, of crypto onto that filtration system with potential negative effects? And so that's the question that this rule answered. It says, hey, if you're, if you're trying to recycle your backwash water, recycle it back to the head of the plant where that water will receive all of the treatment, chemical treatment, coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, so forth, that the other water will receive to optimize the removal of those cryptosporidium particles before they hit the filter and minimize the potential for a slug of that stuff going through the filter. So that's basically what this rule said. And surface water treatment facilities that recycle their backwash water basically have to document that they're doing that properly. So as a result of all this discussion, understanding the wa water quality, understanding some of the regulations we need to meet, what are some of the objectives that we have typically in surface water treatment facilities? Well, we want to remove turbidity. We want to do taste and odor control. Perhaps if we have high hardness in the sur surface water source, we want to do hardness removal. We had that lead and copper rule, so we need to do corrosion control. And of course, we want to make sure that we disinfect the water and do it safely so we don't create something that's toxic for our users. So we have disinfection byproduct control. And basically, all of these removals enable us to be in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act rule. So what are some technologies that we use to do this? Well, in a conventional treatment plant, we would have uh, a capability of removing turbidity and organic uh, matter through rapid mix, flocculation, sedimentation, filtration. In a subsequent presentation, we'll look at systems that enable us to do this. Okay, so we can set this system up to do organics removal, a little bit of taste and odor removal, and turbidity removal. Enhanced settling uh, enables us to compact the size of our treatment facility by improving the settling rate of particles that we create, or flock that we create. And so we might do sand battles to settling, or we might do uh, plate uh, settlers, or tube settlers. We can do softening. We've got this surface water that has high concentrations of hardness sometimes of the year. So we can remove that hardness, but in doing this also help remove turbidity from water. We can get some taste and odor and color removal from this if some of that organic matter is removed in the softening process. We can use membrane systems to do turbidity removal as well. Ultra and microfilters uh, do this. Uh, that was focusing on turbidity. I also mentioned some of the other, turbidity, uh, other uh, removals that could occur. These are some of the uh, uh, systems that we'll use for taste, odor, and color removal and organics removal. So oxidation, using chemical oxidants to alter the nature of that organic matter so that either the taste and odor character is destroyed or perhaps we can make it more coagulatable. Follow that with coagulation using uh, different types of coagulants. We've got, in this case, the traditional ones of aluminum sulfate ferric chloride. There are variations of other chemicals, uh, polyaluminum chlorides, aluminum chlorohydrates that uh, uh, vendors have manufactured to enable us to do that as well. We can absorb organic matter, taste and odor causing substances on organic carbon. We might do this in a granular nature, similar to regular uh, granular filter media, or we can use powdered carbon and feed it like a chemical slurry and get the interaction to occur to remove it as well by absorption of that organic matter on the surface of that activated carbon. How about for hardness removal? We've already talked about softening. The traditional softening process is lime soda ash softening to precipitate hardness particles. And uh, mem membrane systems can be configured as well and are becoming more popular uh, for both surface and groundwater facilities, including nanofiltration and reverse osmosis. How about corrosion control? Well, I had mentioned the two most common adjustments we'll make to water quality is for pH adjustment and for uh, putting in an inhibitor. For pH adjustment, if we're doing a softening system, we can do that with recarbonation. Uh, in some uh, systems that aren't extensively treated, we might be able to, and in fact, this would be more for groundwater than surface water, we might be able to aerate it to raise the pH, releasing the carbon dioxide that depress the pH or we might be able to do a little bit of a hydroxide addition. We have to be careful if we're not softening the water ahead of the system that we don't raise the pH too high, otherwise we'd cause softening to occur on the distribution system. We have phosphate inhibitors that can be used, and uh, this is one of the areas where I'm thinking I, I know less about this than I should, but phosphate chemistry can be uh, added to the water to lower the solubility 
of uh, lead and copper. And then finally, disinfection. You know, uh, we've changed our vernacular about disinfection in my lifetime. Going from just, we've got a disinfectant, to thinking about the part of disinfection that kills the organisms, and then the part of the disinfection that enables us to carry a disinfectant residual into the distribution system without creating poisons, you know, treat trilomethanes and halocyanic acids. So the primary disinfectant part of that is what is used to establish kill in the surface water treatment facility. Secondary disinfectant is the part of that that is used to establish a protecting residual of a disinfectant that's not so reactive with organics to form trihalomethanes and halocyanic acids. So we put these together in treatment process schemes. Uh, we might have a scheme that looks like this, some kind of pre-oxidation for taste and odor control, a turbidity removal or some type to remove that turbidity, a softening system to remove hardness, filtration system to get that turbidity down to 0.3 NTU, and then disinfection. We'll put them in this order because that typically works the best in terms of uh, the chemistries and works the best in terms of, uh, for example, inhibiting creation of disinfection byproducts. In other words, we won't put a disinfectant into the water up here at the front. We won't put chlorine into the water up at the front of the plant because that's where the organic concentrations are the highest. And so we've fallen into this order of things because in the scheme of treatment, it works out best from a chemistry standpoint to put them in this order. So what does that look like in terms of treatment process schematics? Well, here we have an intake, uh, potassium permanganate oxidation of organic matter at the intake, followed by a traditional uh, conventional uh, coagulation system where a coagulant of some sort is added into a rapid mix. Also have powdered activated carbon in here for taste and odor control. Uh, a gentle stirring of that causes uh, growth of flock that can be settled in clarifiers. Uh, ultimately, the turbidity gets down to the limit that we have using filtration. And then chlorine is added to the water. A disinfection time is obtained in the clear well. And then ammonia is added to quench the reaction between chlorine and organics and uh, distribute that water so that it's safe to drink. So in this process, we are meeting the requirements of the coliform rule by having this inhibitory concentration of our disinfectant in the distribution system and also having killed the organisms. We're meeting the requirements of the disinfection byproduct rule. We're killing organisms, but then we're providing a safe residual in the distribution system that won't um, create THMs and HAAs. We're meeting the requirements of the filter backwash rule, recycling the backwash up to the head of the plant meeting the requirements of the surface water, interim enhanced surface water treatment rule by, or LT, LT1, by uh, uh, supplying adequate filtration and coagulation. Another option would be to go something like this, and this is more of uh, uh, a treatment facility where you have extremely high pulses of turbidity and need to do turbidity removal uh, aggressively. So in this case, we have an intake, same kind of pre-oxidation, a ballasted sand, turbidity removal system that enables us to handle that turbidity up into the thousands, okay? Uh, followed by a solids contact clarifier for softening, choosing lime or soda ash depending upon the extent of softening we need. Followed by recarbonation to bring the pH back down to a tolerable level, typically around nine. Then followed by granular media filter to get our turbidity down to 0.3. And then we go with this primary and secondary disinfectant of our choice. You know, it might be ozone, it might be chlorine for that primary disinfectant. And then typically creating a chloramine residual as a secondary disinfectant. So we have this list of rules that we're you know, using here uh, to judge the success of treatment. Might be able to substitute that filter with an alter filter, you know, as an alternative. Or if we're heading down the road of my membrane filtration, we might have simply an uh, integrated membrane plant where we come in at the intake with our, our chemical feed, perhaps powdered activated carbon or an aluminum chlorohydrate or some kind of coagulant that's tolerant uh, on the uh, microfilter or ultra filter. Turbidity particles removed in this ultrafilter. And if we want to do softening of this water, that can be done with a nanofilter or a RO system. We'll bypass some water around that to be able to get the correct mineralogical composition of the treated water, do disinfection with primary disinfection. So this might be appropriate for a relatively low turbidity source, such as what we might have in a reservoir. 
There are enhancements that we can do to surface water treatment to uh, basically uh, remove specialized substances. For example, we can do advanced oxidation where we might use ozone and hydrogen peroxide or UV and peroxide to get at some of the more difficult organic matter that we might be asked to remove, such as some synthetic organic contaminants or pharmaceuticals and personal care products, or even taste and odor. So we can implement this in that system to accomplish those types of removals. Or we might consider biological filtration, which is becoming more and more popular, where organisms are grown on the surface of a granular media filter that like that organic matter for food. And so that organic matter can remove, be removed, taste and odor causing compounds, TOC, uh, pharmaceuticals, personal care products, or food to those organisms. And so they can be removed on this uh, biological filtration system that's typically at the end of the plant. So those enhancements to the processes. So this was intended to be an overview of water quality, of the rules that apply uh, to surface water, and of treatment technologies that uh, we would be applying.